Hey, welcome to episode two of the Laser Cutter Build Series. Um, I'd like to start off by apologizing for the delay in getting this episode out. That was completely unintentional. I work in the film industry as a designer and I had the opportunity to work on a massive Hollywood blockbuster movie. Um, so naturally I just kind of dropped everything and threw all of my time into that. Um, but that contract has wrapped up now and yeah, we can get back to doing the fun stuff. Now, if you're new here, I'm doing a deep dive on building a CO2 laser cutter so that you can follow along. Um, and at the end of my project, I'm gonna release the, the plans, step-by-step -step guide, part list, everything you need to help with your build as well. So catching up from last episode, I talked through some of my design considerations and we also got the inner frame roughly built out. One of the takeaways from last episode was the order of assembly of some of the parts needed to be taken into account uh, because of the type of T-slot nut I was using. So I just wanted to touch on that first. Now there's a whole bunch of specialist T-slot fasteners available and in general there's two flavors, what I'm going to call destructive and non-destructive. And what I mean by that is destructive fasteners require some type of machining, generally just a hole drilled into one side of the aluminium and this makes for a strong joint but it means you've lost the ability to adjust it if you change your mind later, which I have a tendency to do. And because I'm essentially making a prototype, being able to change my mind and change things as I go is real important. Um, so I'm going to stick with the non-destructive fasteners for this build. Uh, so here are a few of the most common types that I'll be using. We've got the standard slide-in type, which slides in from the end. A rotating type, which can be dropped in from the top and locked in place as it's screwed. A roll-in type, which can also be popped in the top. And this arm-in type, which kind of goes in the front and then disappears. Despite the convenience of the middle two, I opted to go with the standard slide-in fitting in most places because of their large anchoring area and the depth of thread makes them more secure. And if they become loosened, they have almost no chance of accidentally dropping out, which I have seen happen, especially with the rotating ones. And they're also cheaper, so there's that. Uh, now don't get me wrong, drop-in fittings do have their place and I probably will use them later on in the build, but I prefer where I can to go with the slide-in types. So speaking of sliding into things, today I want to get started on the x-axis gantry. Which is made up of the y-axis carriages made from v-wheel plates, the x-axis gantry beam, and the x-axis linear rail. Now a couple of you have noted that I've reversed the axis configuration on this laser cutter versus your typical laser cutter engraver. Many of the commercial ones that I've used have the x-axis as the longer axis, and I assume this is for faster engraving speeds across its length but it's at the cost of rigidity. For me, it makes more sense to have the shorter axis as the x-axis because there's less weight flying around and also the linear rails are like half the price. It's also only noticeable if you're doing a larger size build like mine. If you're doing anything less than say 600 millimeters or two by two feet, it would be a conventional setup anyway. Before I begin putting all these components on, I'm giving all the bearings and moving parts a full degrease and relube. These parts often arrive with really heavy duty grease on them, which is great at protecting them while they're in storage, but not so great for sliding around smoothly. I'm starting with the bearings that go in the V-wheels. I'm not sure if this is the best method, but I gave them a gentle a swooshing and a soak and some kerosene to remove the grease and let them dry out completely before applying some light lithium grease. And it seems to make quite a difference. I gave the linear rail the same treatment. I popped the ball bearings out, which I was genuinely terrified of losing, gave them all a clean and reassembled again with some light lithium grease. There was a slight improvement but not nearly as drastic as what I was hoping for so I, don't know, I guess we'll see in the future whether that's something to be concerned about or not. With the bearings sorted out I can begin putting these bits together. Uh, these are the parts for assembling a v-wheel. We've got two bearings, a rim and a one millimeter spacer. They all pop together pretty easily you might need a bit of force to seat the bearings, but just repeat that seven more times. These V-wheels then turn into the Y-axis carriages. So we've got the gantry plates, the V-wheels, M5 bolts, spacers, eccentric nut. Well, these things are very cool. They have an offset hole so that when they're rotated, they move and adjust tension between the wheel and the rail. I'll show you in a sec. Um, and then finally the lock nuts. The bolts go through the wheels with a spacer on top and are screwed down to the plate. The plate has different holes for the eccentric nuts and the regular spacers, so just pay attention to that. I 
I then went around with a 8mm spanner and tightened them all down. Here's the thing with tightening down bearings. If you just crank down on them hard, you put extra pressure on the bearings and they don't spin so good. Uh, and if you do it too loose, they're just going to kind of flop around everywhere. So I think of it as tight enough so there's no slop left in the bolt, but loose enough so there's no binding on the wheel. Which is normally kind of like tightened up and then backed off maybe like an eighth of a turn. If you're wondering why I have the nuts sticking out the top of the plate, uh, when it would look better to have the heads of the bolts so they're kind of nice and flat, well you're not alone. Uh, but it turns out the nuts foul on the frame when I tried it that way first. I mentioned this before but it is worth repeating, the V wheels are designed specifically to roll in the groove of V-slot aluminium. Uh, this is the only difference between V-slot and T-slot aluminium extrusion. Now I can adjust the eccentric nuts with a 10mm spanner to give a firm but smooth grip against the rail. To attach the x-axis gantry beam, I'm installing two nuts on each of the y-axis gantry plates, so I can just slide in the beam and tighten it down. You'll, you'll see at this stage I'm just installing things by eye. Um, when I'm ready with all the parts on, I will go round and square everything up properly. The linear rail has holes for M3 bolts, but the only M3 nuts I have on hand are the rotating type we talked about earlier, uh, which isn't ideal, but should be totally fine. As I'm screwing these down, I like to give them a fast little spin to start them off. This helps the nut kind of rotate properly down in the slot. As I've seen some of them, if you tighten down too gently, weirdly, um, it won't actually spin in the slot and it won't grip. Um, and I also lucked out and managed to find myself a nice round head screw. Now I can attach the head assembly to the rail slider with four M3 screws. Just worth noting, if you don't already know, when I say hardware sizes like M3, the M refers to metric and the 3 means it goes in a 3mm hole. So M4, M5, M6, M8, etc. They're all just the millimeter diameter of the thing. Hey, so unfortunately, I'm going to wrap this episode up here. The next steps are going to need some 3D printing done, which is going to take me a few days. So I'm figuring if I get those on the go while I do the editing for this video, it's going to speed us up a bit. And I do promise to get the next one out quicker than the last one.